Uh, so as I said, it started yeah quite uh, quite soon by essentially physicists that were mathematically inclined, I would say, right? In particular, the Russian school uh, uh, with uh, I am Lifshitz and uh, Leonid Pasteur. And uh, what I'm going, what I chose to do at first, I was thinking when I thought about the course, I wanted to do an overview, right? But the problem is that overview with result, I mean, usually it's just an enumeration of results. And it's, uh, the results are, there are so many of them, right? And it goes in all directions. It's a bit difficult to put order in all this, right? Moreover, many of the results have the same tonality. They tell you, well, take this system, it's localized. Take that system, it's also localized. Take this system under these conditions, it's localized and so on. So what I chose to do is something different. What I'm going to do is something, take a very simple system, actually essentially the system that Anderson introduced in his seminal paper, and, well, prove localization, right? I'm going to show you the tools that will give you, I hope, in three hours in the end, a mathematical proof of localization. To do this, I will need to introduce a number of concepts many of you are familiar with, at least some the mathematicians from the mathematical point of view, and some of the physicists may be in a different language, but still you are familiar with them, right? So let me start with the model, okay? As a mathematician, I need a mathematical object to work on, so I start with the model. It's a very simple model. It's not even a PDE. It's going to be a finite difference equation, right? So it's the Anderson model. So we'll be working on the Hilbert space, which in this case happened to be the square summable sequences indexed by ZD, okay? And for a function or a sequence in this space, well, we define an operator. I put the omega right away at some point x. is just the sum of the nearest neighbors. So it's u at y minus u at x, the L1 distance from y to x being 1 in ZD, right? x and y are points in ZD, plus some potential, which is just a real-valued function. That's the only thing I ask for to the moment, right? Uh, this is real. Okay. And uh, so here we have not even an equation, we have a definition of an operator, H, right? And of course, obviously, H omega, well, it's not difficult to check that at least if, let me say this, <coughs> to make it simple, if this sequence is bounded, then this thing is actually a nice linear object mapping L2 from ZD to L2 from ZD, right? So, okay, and what am I interested in? Well, I want to solve an equation, and the equation I'd like to solve is a Schrodinger equation. So what is it? 1 over i d by dt psi h omega psi, or u, let me call it u again, right? And u at time equals 0 is some function u0, right? I'd like to understand who is u of t. And of course, it's u of t and x. And in particular, I'm interested in what's happening depending on u0, what can be said of the behavior when time goes to infinity of u of t, right? What, does, what happens to the solution to this equation, okay? Of course, it also depends, crucially, on h omega. Okay. 
So, uh, okay. But now, well, let's start with, as mathematicians, I'm going to start with the theorem. I call it theorem A, which is also called dynamical localization. Uh, which is the following. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that V omega of X, right? Uh, mm, I'm going to write V omega of X. Maybe I can do something up there. I'll change the model slightly so that you can include. I'm changing the model slightly. I just include a coupling constant here, right? And now I am going to assume, so these things now are random. I'm going to pick them random, right? This is about random operators. And I'm going to pick them identically independent and identically distributed, right? So I just, uh, well, I don't want them to be coin flips, but I'm going to choose something according. I'm going to say something or to ask something about the distribution according to a law, which is the P of V that we had in Jerry's talk. The law is going to be of the following, G, V, D, V. So it's going to be AC respect to the Lebesgue measure, right? And the density of the law I'm going to ask to be bounded and G compactly supported. To make things simple, right? I just want to keep things as basic as possible. To prove such a theorem in three hours, right? We need to keep things simple, okay? And uh, the result is First, uh, I thought I had two, okay. Looks like I, yeah, two results. One, the first result, actually it's a rephrasing of the same results. So there exists uh, lambda zero positive such that for lambda, the sign of lambda doesn't really matter larger than lambda zero, there exists a mu which is actually depending on lambda, but you can take it independent of lambda for lambda large enough, positive, such that omega almost surely, so meaning that if you fix a realization, right, for almost all of them, you get the following. So I called, if I take, if u0, I take my initial function, I look at the Schrodinger equation, take support of u0 inside the ball of center zero radius r, right? Uh, then let u be the solution to the Schrodinger equation. This depends on lambda, I don't rewrite it. Then if you, so for you defined by, as a solution of this equation, uh, one has u of t and x, the supremum over all time of this is what is less than some constant which depends on omega. There is a constant depending on omega here. E to the minus mu distance from x to the ball of center zero and r, right? Uh, and this for all x in ZD. And because this is this constant, right? Boop, boop, boop. Maybe I put it, well, I don't, know, I don't have much space here. 
what I know about this constant is that actually it's essentially finite, meaning that if I take it's a measurable function, it can be integrated with respect to the probability space, and the integral is finite. So the value, the almost sure value of this constant is finite. Right? It's almost sure. Sorry? Sorry, I didn't understand. Exactly, I have a condition which is the coupling is large enough, right? The potential, the importance of the potential is that it's large enough. In some cases, actually, this can be made more precise. We're going to see such a case at the very end, right? But uh, under these assumptions, this, this condition depends on essentially the omega gamma, right? And the fact that I chose the Laplacian. Okay? That's one way to put it. Another way to say the same thing is equivalent is the following, is that if I look at the semi-group generated, which is, of course, the, what gives you the solution, delta x, delta y, this thing, supremum over t in R, is bounded by c omega e to the minus mu x minus y, right? Uh, yes, actually, I'm going to write it in this way. Let me think. Uh, I'm going to, let me just think. I need to do one thing. If I do this, I'm going to rewrite it a different way. Sorry. <coughs> e to the minus I'm sorry, e to the x minus y times mu. And I take the sum over y, right? And I take the soup over x, right? And this is finite. So what does it mean? So. The t is in here. Soup over t. There is a soup over t. You control it uniformly in t. So what does it mean? What is this? Of course, u at t and x is just e to the i. Sorry, not the minus. I'm going, as it's a soup over t, doesn't really matter the sign. Of u 0 at x. Right? It's just this. Just apply the semi-group. I come back to this in a second, right? I mean, for those of you that are not familiar with this, right? I, I'll come back to this in a second, okay? I'll explain you what all of this is. Uh, okay. And so, once you have such an estimate, you just, inter you just sum, right? You multiply by y, by u of y, and you sum, and you immediately get the other property. Right, and this is a, I can do derivation, but it's, a, it's an immediate thing to get the other property. So this is what is called dynamical localization. Why is it called dynamical localization? This tells you why. It's because of the following. You, you start with an initial packet, right, which is localized in some ball. This thing is telling you that you never really leave the ball, because outside the ball, the thing says, uniformly in time, exponentially small. Right? So, what happens, it always happens inside a ball, a local, right, something local. The, it, if you do the same thing, if you do the same thing with replacing minus Laplacian plus V omega by just minus Laplacian, what you're going to see is that your packets are going to go to infinity, right, and there won't be any decay here, right? There will be no decay here. It doesn't decay over time. Okay. Okay, and the second, the second version, which is actually it's called spectral localization. Okay, what is it? Well, it's just a. Oh, the mu Sorry, the mu depends on lambda. You mean the mu? Yeah, the mu does depend on lambda, as is indicated here, but actually, it's the optimal mu. In a way, if I have this for one mu, of course I have it for all smaller mu's. 
Of course, it depends on the probability distribution, just like the lambda zero here. It depends on all the parameters in your system, right? And how it depends on these parameters is non-trivial. But I'll show you an estimate, because the problem is to get the optimal one, and that's something which is highly non-trivial. The optimal one may very depend on the initial state. If you want to play with this, right, the optimal way the thing diffuses depends on the initial state. If you think of a landscape of the potential, you can imagine that some things have easier way, they, they don't really spread out, but they may spread further or less far, right? Exactly. So here, the, the, the C of omega actually does not depend. Yeah, one thing I should have said, there exists a C of omega here. The thing is, there exists a C of omega which is here. It's not, mathematically, it's not placed at the right time, at the right place. It does not depend on you. It's the same for all the equation, for all the, uh, up to uh, maybe a, a soup norm of u, right? But you need some problem, otherwise it's not homogeneous, right? The equation is obviously homogeneous, but m except for some norm of u0, right? Uh, which is, uh, the L2 norm is the right thing to do. Uh, actually, maybe not the L2 one. I may have to be careful. Uh, well, take, take the soup norm of u0. Right? But otherwise, the C, the constant, does not depend on you. It, it's just coming from this. It's just coming from this one. Right? Once you know that this one holds, you're just going to compute this by using that formula. Right? So it means that this is Yeah, you may you may need uh, to you. There is a there is a function of there is a function of r, right? Let's to be safe. Let's put the volume of the ball in which it lives, right? But I agree with you. Sure, it, it, this plays a role. But you see, the volume can always be uh, well, not well. Okay, so no, mu is a constant. Doesn't depend on omega. No, you can choose it independent of omega. Okay, and the second theorem is same assumptions as theorem A. So we do the same assumptions. There exists again a lambda zero, which may not be the same, right? So this is, so you can get your lambda zero and your mu such that omega almost surely, <coughs> almost surely, there exists C of omega, I'm going to keep the C of omega here, right here. First, first thing is that if you look at the spectrum, so this thing is just a huge matrix, right? I'm going to define the spectrum for those of you who don't know it in a moment, right? But think of it as a matrix, okay? So you look at the spectrum, okay? Well, the spectrum is actually made only of eigenvalues, okay? This is a, in case of matrix, it's always the case, right? The finite dimensional matrix. Here we are in a matrix in an infinite setting, right? It's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And because of this, the notion of spectrum, the notion, eigenvalues are still defined by the same thing, but the notion of spectrum is more complicated. You may have states like plane waves or Laplacian, right? That are not eigenvalues, but still give you energies in the spectrum, right? What I'm telling you here is that the energies in the spectrum are only eigenvalues, even the infinite system. So you see, this is a big difference with uh, Thierry's talk. He was talking about real physical 
systems, meaning that they are always finite. Here, we went to some extension, we go to infinite systems, and of course the fact that the systems are infinite brings its lot of problems, right? You have to deal with huge spaces, but also its simplifications, right? Because in such infinite systems, as you will see, there is some self-averaging going on, okay? Under the right assumptions on the model. Whereas in finite systems, whether the scale is already large enough for some self-averaging to occur is de very much depending on the system, right? Here we're dealing with an infinite system. So, so the things, they are made of eigenvalues. And the second thing is that if E is, so it's made of eigenvalues, and moreover, these eigenvalues, they are simple. Meaning that if you can solve, what does it mean that they are simple? If you solve the equation, the eigenvalue equation, h omega with, you look at the solution, the set of u in L2 zd that solve this equation, then you have two possibilities. Then this is either the null vector space, there are no solutions except the trivial one, or it's a one-dimensional space. This is the meaning of the sense simple, right? Eigenvalues are simple. It means that if you take an energy, either the solution to the eigenvalue equation, which is this equation, is reduced to the null space, or if it's not the null space, it is a one-dimensional space. Let me get this one down again. Okay. And uh, no, this is not the correct one. And if E is an eigenvalue, you can take a normalized eigenvector associated to E, right? That's the definition of being an eigenvalue. So it's just a solution of H omega minus phi minus E, phi of E equals zero, and phi of E in L2 norm is equal to one. This is what it means. And you take any of these, then you have, one has, uh, there exists a point for any such eigenvalue, there exists a point in ZD such that if I look at phi of E at X, it's going to be less than the constant C omega I have above there, times one plus X of E to the minus, uh, to the D plus one over two, e to the minus mu x minus x of e. Right? So what does it mean? It means that, so you have only eigenvalues, and the eigenfunctions associated to these eigenvalues decay exponentially when you go away from their localization center. Right? What does it mean, localization center? So it's this point. Of course, the point is not defined uniquely. Right? There's no unique point like this. Okay? And uh, so what does it say? It says that up to this factor, right? There is this factor. And this factor exists and it's important. It's not there for nothing. It is really there. You need to take this correction. We decay exponentially, right? What does it mean? Because of this factor. So imagine space. So you have uh, your random system. And let me put zero somewhere and take some x of e, which is very far apart, right? Imagine that you're looking at eigenfunctions that are localized far apart from zero. Then this becomes large, right? Which means that actually this relation, the square of these numbers, right, sum up to one. 
this is my normalization condition. Okay? So it means that as soon as this one is larger than 1, the relation here is no good at all, because of course if the square of the numbers sums up to 1, each of these numbers had better be less than 1. Okay? So this relation is only worth something as long as this is not above 1. Okay? Otherwise, you just throw it away. It's a trivial bound. What does it mean? It means that you have some ball, which is roughly of size log of 1 plus times a constant, over which this thing is going to be larger than 1. So the bound is useless. What does it mean? It means that if you go away from 0, your result on localization gets weaker and weaker. Right? You have more and more space where you actually don't know where the eigenfunction does live. Right? That's something you, very s you don't see in, physics, in the physics literature. In physics literature, usually they write what is wrong, as far as I know, maybe you, you tell me different, such a factor is missing, meaning that you would have localization uniformly, right, all over space. Of course, it's never really expressed in this way. Okay? But you, you would have a look at Yes? Wait, I, have, I have two confusions. One, yep. one is x. Yes? Is it a one-dimensional or is it just a one real? Or is no, it's, it's a, x is a point in the lattice. x here, you see, is for any x in zd. Okay. So it's your, it's your configuration space. Exactly. The, the difference comes up. Exactly. The, co the difference comes up here. In 1D, this is for lambda 0 is equal to 0. Right? This is 1D. And in 2D, one doesn't need to do any better than in 3D and so on. Okay? And the second confusion that I had, uh -huh. I'm not sure I understand what 0 means. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's another point. Yeah. Exactly. Zero doesn't mean anything. It, uh, I could do the same thing. I could do the same thing and center it around any point. Right? It's so that's very, very strange. So you have several, they're not quite equivalent statements for different... Well, they... they, they no, no, no. They, they are... Um, let me think. Uh, No, no, it's, it, it is, uh, except for this constant here. And this constant plays a role. But uh, let me think, let me, yeah, but exactly, that's the whole point. No, but that's the whole point. You see, you see, when zero doesn't play a role, if you average over realizations. But here I fix realization. When I fix a realization, zero plays a role again, because I have fixed the realization. That's the whole point. This is what the C of omega plays for. Right? This is, the point is that the C omega... More, more uh, but if you change omega, the origin could be anywhere. I see. So the point is you have an origin, but then if your radius, some large radius, there are many, many possible origins. If, if you, yeah, that's one way to see it. But the best way, I think, the best way to think of it is that to say that the origin doesn't play a role, right, is exactly doing an average over the randomness. Meaning using the ergodicity, but this is not what you're doing here. This is an almost sure result. I fix an omega, and then I tell you something about the operator with a fixed omega. So this, it, it is the C omega that fixes the special role of the origin. Or if you want, if you change the origin, you're going to change C omega. But you still keep the integrability. You still keep this, right? But you see, the, the C omega is what is choosing the origin. I could choose any point, of course. I could take any point. No question. Okay? But the point is that the, the idea of thinking of the system as being um, ergodic, right, or uh, transitive, metrically transitive, is wrong in this picture because this is not what you're using. You're using at fixed omega. Your statement is for a given omega. Right? And so this is, it is, if you want, this constant that chooses the origin. Mm -hmm. radius r, yes. then you, there are many choices for the origin. Yes. So you're interviewing a very large number of boxes at that, yes. at that scale. And, and, and 
So this, this would, we, we have many, many realizations of omega in order to, to know to, to act. So in other words, you would have to have simultaneously all of the more of radius one. Ah, okay, I see what you mean. Okay, you can, you can say it in this way. Okay, I, I see what you mean. I, I, okay, I, I understand what you mean. Okay, that's one way to put it, actually, to, to resolve the contradiction that may exist. But I think the resolution of the contradiction is really the fact that the C depends on omega, and the, to say that the origin doesn't matter is something which is averaging of omega, right? It's considering that your system is translational invariant, which is not, right? Because uh, there's a very simple example, which is actually the prototypical example that shows you that this is unavoidable. Imagine that you have a large, uh, this, this infinite thing, and there is a, a big chunk around the origin where your potential vanishes, right? Of course, this is going to happen with a positive probability, right? And then, of course, there'll be eigenfunctions looking like free waves in this chunk. And from these eigenfunctions, you'll be able to build eigenfunctions over the whole thing that are still, in this chunk, something rather flat. And therefore, you need this, right? There's, there's no way you can avoid this. Okay, and that's, <laughs> it may be a small point, maybe a little, but it's important in the sense that the picture cannot be uniform, right? It is what makes the difference between a translation invariant system and an ergodic system, right? Where translation invariance is only over the average. Here we don't take an average. Okay, so my aim is to prove this, right? These two things. Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, when you say that the mu does not depend Yes. No, no, no. Here you have, a, yeah, if you want, this is omega almost surely. So you have a set of total measure, right, for which the mu is the same. Of course, omega, right, you could equate, because these are independent, identically distributed, you could make, equate the probability space. The probability space is just r to the zd, right, and you're just selecting a real number for each of the components. Okay, that's the only thing you are doing with your potential. And of course, I could, for example, select all these real numbers to be the same. In which case, the potential I get here is just this constant times the identity. So my operator, if I select this omega, will only be minus Laplacian plus a constant, which is, of course has the spectrum of the Laplacian shifted by this constant. And the eigenvalues, there are none, it's only absolutely continuous spectrum, right? But of course, you can do this, but only with probability zero, right? This is not something that's going to happen very often, okay? Again, we are playing with the fact that we are dealing with infinite dimensional objects. Sure. So uh, 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 what kind of improvements would you think of, actually? I don't... Well, I mean, morally speaking, I mean, look at the finite system, the lower on the right-hand constant, the more on the right-hand higher on the right-hand constant. Yes. Yeah. So the lower on the right-hand constant is uh, possible, but not possible. And here, but... Uh, well, you see, but the, the, then, then, this would think, actually, what you are referring to, and can be done, as far as I know, in one dimension, is more, rather than improving this one, it would be to improve this one. This one, you could take mu depending on energy. Depending on where you are in the energy spectrum, you get a different rate of decay, right? And this can be done in one dimension. It's actually given by what is called the Lyapunov exponent, right? And in higher dimension, I'd well, you can do it, right, in, in the sense that <laughs> once you have this, you can do, take this inequality and sip out of it mu. So you coin a formula giving you the mu for this given eigenfunction. And then you can take, optimize this in energy, okay? And this will give you, whether you can control the mu thus defined is another story. This I don't know. Well, what is it? My answer is I don't know. Right? That, that's, uh, that's for sure. But one thing I want to say, so in one dimension you know what it is, it's the Apunov exponent, right? It's just controlling the growth of the transfer matrices. But in higher dimensions, it's not known. There is, oh yeah, I must, I must say something about this. There is something like this, actually. 
uh, which is also called the Apun of Expound. And I'm sure you know of the book by Alain Saul Snetman, uh, what is it, uh, Brownian motion in uh, random obstacles, or maybe not this case, it's random, random motion in random obstacles, I don't remember, it's a book in Springer about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, where he actually defines the Apun of Exponent higher dimensions, right? But the thing is, it is related to that, but only in some very small part of the spectrum, because he is interested only at the bottom of the spectrum, because it deals with the heat equation, okay? So, but it gives you a hint of what it is, okay? But in general, I don't think they're... But Kiel doesn't pay it, people. Sorry? So, so Kiel doesn't pay it, people don't know. Right? Yeah, I'm actually, it's interesting, but I'm not sure that people really try to do it very hard. Right? I'm, I don't know. I, of course, I don't know of the tries of everybody, but I'm not sure that... I, 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 at least, I don't remember a talk <laughs> that where this, there was a focus on this. Very good question, actually. <coughs> Very good. Sure, I, I can I can comment on that. But let me is first. there a moment where we are going to make a plain translation between these language and what we know of Anderson localization, for instance, the scaling theory, the f how we depend from the dimension, etc. Okay, so. Unfortunately, I, I, I understand your question. So the question was, will there be a translation to more physical terms yeah. of... To usual language of physicists? Exactly. Well, the, my first answer, actually my first caveat, is I'm a mathematician. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I think that we, have, we can make a collective work. I'm, this, I, I'm, this I'm perfectly willing to discuss. But from the mathematical point of view, what I want to say is that first, except for the, the distinction between dimension one and higher dimension, which is essentially lambda zero in dimension one is equal to zero, right? Mathematically, right, we don't know much of a difference between two, three, and four dimensions. Nobody's really able, uh, no, mathematically to analyze this, meaning to prove a theorem, right? I'm in still speaking about this. Yes, please. No, I, I was going to say that's exactly the point. The first important point in the theorem here is uh, there is a lambda zero Exactly. So that exactly. are exponentially localized. So the this is strong disorder. Regime. Exactly. That's the strong disorder regime. There is one other regime when, when one knows to prove such results, right? Because I wanted to prove a theorem, right, to show you in simple words how this goes. I don't want to speak about all the regimes, but there is another regime, which is the spectral edges, right? Meaning that if you look at the spectrum of your random operator of the Anderson model, well, under the assumptions I have on the board, you can show that actually it's a finite collection of intervals, right? It's the union of a finite collection of intervals. And at the spectral edges, meaning at the edges of these intervals of spectrum, you can prove analogous results, right? Meaning to prove localization, both dynamical and the spectral localization, right? So there are also works that try to compute uh, via the Kubo formula, what is the conductivity, right? But I'm not sure, actually, there is a completely conclusive work in this direction, right? So this is uh, mathematically, so for physicists, for example, the Anderson transition is something which is given, right? Which is well known and has been for, well, 40 years, maybe, right? 60 years? No, in 1960. Ah, sorry. Yeah, okay, so it's, uh, okay, maybe 60 years. Yeah, but he had the, he had already had the transitions in there. Uh, I, I mean, the Anderson transition. I'm speaking the Anderson, the, tr the sharp transition between. I was thinking of the 70s, early 70s. This is why I said 40 years, okay. right? So if it is, if it is in mathematics, I know of a single result, right, which doesn't even show transitions, right? It just shows something happens someplace. I mean, in localization, cannot stay correct all over the range of the spectrum, and for a simple model. So this is something which is, so you see that in a way, because we're proving theorems, we are much behind. So you mean you don't have the transition here? No, but and it's a... Uh, there is no value of lambda? Uh, well, there is a value of lambda zero, you can crunch it out, but you don't know what's happening when you're less than lambda zero. There is no mathematical result. So that is okay. Something can happen, so something it's can easier, happen. It's easier for mathematicians to prove that there is a localization, that there is a relocalization. Exactly. Much easier. Mm -hmm. For physicists, it's a little 
Well, I can give a, I can actually give <laughs> a reason for that. The the reason, right? So the question is, it's so the question was, it's or well, the statement was, it's for mathematicians, it's much easier to prove localization than delocalization. Well, that's a state of matter, right? There are no results. Essentially, there's I know only one. There were no results on delocalization, right? Rigorous proof hey, for for random models. There are many results for quasi-periodic models in 1D, right? For the Harper equation, what you call the aubry andre model, there are many results in 1D. Above 1D, there are also results where you have some form of delocalization, right? There is no complete picture of the spectrum, or, but there are results about what is called AC spectrum, right? So delocalized states. If you want plane waves, people were able to construct by hand plane waves. Yes, please. Exactly. Uh, sure. Because of time rigid, or also, or or also because this is the the only setting that needs to go. Oh, no, no, that's not true. That that. So so typically, typically, if you take on L two of R D, take uh, H omega to be minus Laplacian plus the sum of V. Uh, let me put some models on the board. Omega, so V of X minus gamma. So this is a continuous Anderson model, right? This is a, the little V is some function which is a compact bump. For such models, under reasonable assumptions on these random variables, the same kind of results have been proved, right? If you look at the model which is quite close to the one Thierry had on the board, uh, V of X minus XI, X, uh, so I sum over I, and Xi is a Poisson process, right? Localization, though not this one, but the form of that one, which is not the same estimates, but some estimates, has been proved, right? Uh, if you take another thing, so gamma in Zd, and x gamma are iid. So now you displace, right? What you do is you have the grid, and you place your random potential off the grid randomly, right? For such model, the same results have also been proved, right? So there are many models, actually, not only Schrodinger. Things have been proved of the same kind for the acoustic equation, for the wave equation for the Maxwell operator, for many other models, right? Using one of two methods, right? Most of them, not the method I present, because it's the technically more complicated to set up, right? But there are various methods that have been devised to prove such things. But it's always localization that has been proved, right? Maybe I should, I should make a small comment at this point, is that there are models where something closer to delocalization has been proved by mathematicians, and namely people in probability theory. These are called the random conductance models, right? And they will roughly correspond to the following matrix. Uh, let me just put it in... Um, well, they're roughly, I, I don't want to write the model precisely because I don't have it in my head, but uh, they correspond to off-diagonal disorder. Right? So if you want, they correspond to oscillating springs with random coupling constants. Okay? And in this case, probability theorists have proved not these models. They're not interested in spectral theory. They're not interested in uh, this way. But they looked at the random walk in such random environments, and they proved some recurrence results for the random walk. Right? So they proved some way, some kind of diffusion right, for the random walk. But the fact that the random walk, or non-recurrence result rather, right, they prove non-recurrence result, that the random walk goes off to infinity so that there is some diffusion going on. Okay? It's not completely clear how to translate this into spectral terms, right, or estimates on the semi-group, but it bears the same flavor. Just a word about the, the Anderson transition, right, the delocalization, the diffusion. 
there is a, actually a work which is about 10 years old. by Erdős, uh, now I, and co-authors, uh, Yao, Erdős, Yao, and co-authors, well, there are, they come in varying flavors. The, the two here are stable, right, but the co-authors come in various flavors because it was stretch over a few papers. And uh, so this is in, uh, well, uh, between uh, 2000 and 2010, roughly, right? And when they looked at the following, they looked at the model that is uh, the Anderson model with the coupling constant, right? But they looked at lambda small. They looked at lambda small, and they did look at the infinite model. They looked, so in dimension, larger than three, and they looked at over a box or over times. So they looked at e to the i t h omega lambda uh, over for t. Uh, so what is it? So this is going to be uh, lambda square. So for t, roughly one over square of lambda, right? And they showed that if you look at the solution to the time-dependent equation, right, over not too long time, so it means that over not too long time, you don't really, you can't get the spectrum, right? You can't get the full spectral resolution. But they looked at how the wave evolves over a long time, for a, and long time means that it's long, actually they go two plus epsilon for some small epsilon, long time for a very small potential. They get that the solution at these long times start resembling, or they, it's actually given, right, approximated by the solution to the heat equation. They see the fusion, right, in this limit. But they are not able to go to infinite time. And the way they do it is actually by, uh, the, the, the proof is rigorous, right, it's a proof, and the way they do it is by analyzing the Feynman diagrams, right? They do the expansion, actually they do the, um, what is it called? Uh, when you do the time, time expansion of uh, the, the semi-group, it's a French guy, now I can't remember his name, 19th century. So they do a, it's not exactly a Feynman expa expansion, which is more for the resolvent, this is for the, this is for the group expansion. Uh, and they analyze this using Feynman diagrams. Right, or the same, it's not Feynman diagrams, but the same diagrams for the, the, re, the, the group expansion, okay? Now I can't remember <laughs> the name of the French mathematician or physicist. They do rank one mathematics? Sorry? They do sort of rank no, 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 it has nothing to do with rank one. This, this story is not rank one. It's difficult enough, they use rank one, of course, but it's not really, uh, it's not the main point, right? So they, they don't use, if you want, any algebraic properties of rank one, right? They really analyze the Feynman diagram and uh, by uh, some very clever computations and, well, it's, it's a 150-page well, paper or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's hard technical work, right? These are, it's hard technical work. It's valuable, but it's hard technical work. So, so you see, if I want to speak about theorems, right, as you understood by now, there is not a wealth of results that I have at hand that can actually be proved, right, from a mathematical point of view. The things are just too difficult to analyze. Is this one still on? It is. Okay. So, so how am I doing time-wise, actually, because of the, with the discussion I lost a little bit track of. Ten minutes left? Okay, well, to, s to say that I'm behind schedule is actually a lie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is exactly what I mean. Okay, so, uh, so maybe I can cut some of it out of it, right? 
uh, and come back to some of the questions that we are discussing before. Organic operators. I'll chip in the, what I took out when it's needed. Organic operators. So this is, has to do with actually the question that was asked to Thierry before. So one of the basic features, one of the basic features of my model You got where V omega of X IID is the following thing. It's the following relation is that I write the relation, right? And then I'll tell you what the objects are. Yeah, I take discrete. You can do the same thing for continuous, right? It's because the Laplace name is translation invariant. So what is this? This is T gamma H omega. gamma star, okay? So what is this relation? Well, if you know when you, I'll tell you what tau gamma and t gamma are. Tau gamma, uh, well, tau, yeah, should have called it x actually. So this is for gamma in ZD. Tau gamma acts on these, so V gamma of x is, uh, sorry, V omega of x is V omega of x plus gamma, right? So what you do is you just shift the random variables, right? You take your random variables, so you take your potential if you want, you have your function, right, over ZD, and you shift it by gamma, okay? And T gamma of a function U, so U here is a function which is square summable over ZD, well, at X is U at X minus gamma. You also shift it, right? Uh, actually, it's the same thing. It's x plus gamma. You shift the function, right? And then you check this relation. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that this random variable and this random variable, by assumption, have the same distribution, right? This relation here, this you check. It's a simple computation, right? You put your function u here. The Laplacian commutes with these translations. Right, Laplacian is translation invariant, so of course T gamma, T gamma star is the identity, right? So this goes away, commute through Laplacian. So the only thing to check is for the potential, but for the potential to do this is exactly to do that, okay? And this has an important consequence Of course, as I said, the T gammas are unitaries, so they don't change the spectrum, right? If I change my operator through unitary, conjugate by unitary operator, I don't change the spectrum. But what does this tell you? This tells you that the spectrum, if you see it as a random variable, it's a set, but you can look at it as a random variable, is invariant under translations. As a consequence of this, you get a result which is an old result of Pasteur. Is that there exists sigma, a closed set, such that the spectrum of H omega is sigma omega almost surely. Meaning that the set of allowed energies in your system does not, because the system is infinite, and because of this ergodicity, it does not depend on the realization you choose. Okay? Very natural. Okay? But better than that, there exists some sigma AC, sigma PP, sigma SC, closed, such that if I take sigma dot H omega, it's equal to large sigma dot, where dot is any of the three symbols A, C, S, C, and P, P. Okay, and what does this mean? Okay, let me now reveal what these symbols stand for.
Therefore, I need to introduce something, explanation. If we take a, a self-adjoint operator, you have what is called the spectral decomposition. What does it mean? It means that if I take H self-adjoint and phi a vector, uh, and phi a bounded function, in line, and U a vector in my Hilbert space, I can write the operator phi of U, U as an integral over phi of E, D, mu, U, and E, right? This is linear in the function phi, okay? And the fact that it's linear means that it can be written as the integral of phi against some measure. Actually, linearity itself is not sufficient. You need some continuity property, but it is there. The continuity property is there. This thing is called the spectral measure associated to U and the operator H. In the case of finite dimensional matrices, you know very well what it is. This is just a sum of Dirac masses, right? Exactly at the eigenvalues. And the coefficients of these Dirac masses at the eigenvalues are just the projection of U on the corresponding eigenvectors. But what happens is that because we're in infinite dimension, unfortunately, you have more options for these measures than being pure point. These measures can be any measure, and in particular, you can decompose them using the Lebesgue decomposition in three parts, right? D mu u can be written as D mu u AC plus D mu u pure point plus D mu u SC. AC is just what is a nice integrable function times the Lebesgue measure, right? This actually, one thing, if you integrate this against the constant function one, what you get immediately is that d mu u of e, the total mass is one, right? And obviously, phi positive, this is positive, so this measure has to be a positive measure, right? Uh, not one, it's one if u is normalized. So uh, put norm u squared. This is going to be correct. Right? Okay, so you can do this. This is Lebesgue's decomposition, 1910 or so, okay, of the measure. So this is just, this part is just some function, so of E, D, E. It's a function, an integrable function, times the Lebesgue measure. This part is a sum of Dirac masses with Ci, E minus Ei, and this part is what is remaining, right? So what is remaining is something which does not put any mass on points, but is not absolutely continuous, meaning that it cannot be, it's not, uh, uh, it's singular respect to the Lebesgue measure, right? Okay? And so what you can do is these sets, what do they correspond to? They correspond to the vectors u, actually the vector space generated by the vectors u, well, no, to the vectors u, I can just say this, to the vectors u, for which this decomposition has a single term. AC, it just has AC term. PP, it just has a PP term. And SC, it has just the SC term. And these set of vectors, they are actually proper, or no, not proper, they are invariant subspaces of your initial Hilbert space that form a direct sum such that the direct sum is equal to the whole Hilbert space. Right? This is what is called the spectral theorem. Okay, so this is uh, John von Neumann, I think. And, uh, so, and you see, for our random potential, because of this ergodicity, these sets do not depend on omega. And that's a very important property. Why? why? It's because now you can play with omega to try to analyze who these sets are, right? You have this freedom to move omega around, okay? And with probability one, you're gonna hit an omega that is fine, okay? So you can move them around, so anything with positive probability will 
intersect with the set where this is true to analyze who these sets are. Right? And that's something which is heavily used. Okay. Okay, in particular, for my model, for my model, right, here, you can prove that you can use this for H omega equals minus Laplacian plus V omega, V omega of X IID. You can prove that Sigma, the total spectrum, is equal to, well, what is the spectrum of the Laplacian I wrote down? It's 0, 4D plus the support of G, right, where G is the density of V omega at 0, for example. And for, I, I had, no, I don't have a lambda. I put the lambda away, so that's fine. Yes? Uh, okay. Is it good? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> it's okay. just perfect timing. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. We have time for one or two quick questions if there are any. Yes, please. Okay, um, there is a result by uh, Germinet and Klein um, where essentially they prove that the two are equivalent. You can go over from one to the other one if you have strong results in the way I wrote them down. For example, they looked, uh, well actually, at the minus Laplacian plus V omega, right? You maybe you need something like a Wegener estimate for uh, the finite, and then it's fine. That's the only thing you need. But for example, if you have the Zulia uh, continuous Bernoulli, uh -huh. uh, but then you don't have any of these results. A uh, continuous well, Bernoulli? No, that's fine. Not they're, they're Bourguin -Koenig, yeah, no, sure. You have Bourguin Koenig, but um, you then, but then, no, if you have, if you, these results are not enough to actually get this, because actually if you look at the, what they prove on the localization of eigenfunctions, it is much weaker than the thing. And then it is, this is why I, this is why I said, if you had such strong results on localization, you can go over from dynamical to spectral and vice versa, right? But. Well, it's the fact that you control in, in bourguin koenig you have a constant, right? The C of omega, here it only depends on omega. In bourguin koenig it depends on omega and phi, and you don't know how. And so you don't have any information about how these, uh, what is called, uh, localization centers are in a way spread out. You have no uniformity, right, when you look at the energy. Here I have some uniformity. I can control this, and that's crucial. No, it has nothing to do with the edge of the spectrum. It has to do with the fact that there are some estimates that are missing, for example, the Wegener estimate. Okay, it's not the edge of the spectrum. That, that's not the, the reason. Because you get the, same kind of, you get the same kind of results at edges of the spectrum if you take uh, these assumptions, right? Right, they get some Wegener estimates, right? It's just much weaker. Exactly, and it has to do with this. Because this is what allows you to control this behavior. Right, so um, it has to do with that. <laughs>